going on, guys? Welcome back to This Is IT. I'm Network Chuck. I got David Bomble here. Um, say hi, David. Hey, everyone. Hope you're enjoying the shows as always. Uh, Chuck always laughs, laughs when I say hello. So, Chuck, I must be doing something wrong that you always because laugh you, at me. Because you say the same thing every time. Well, it's, that's like I'm old and that's all I know how to say. So, I, I could say something else like, good day, well, everyone well, from you could, the UK. But, but you'll forget that you said the same thing last time. So, you'll just keep repeating yourself. That's what old people do. Um, <laughs> well, anyways. You better move probably, along quickly now. Oh, I know, I know. So, anyways, we have this week. Uh, on the show, we have Jason Gooley. Um, this guy is the godfather of network programmability, which is a term I'm not sure I quite understand yet, so we're going to pick that yeah. out. And then uh, he's also a double CCIE. He works for Cisco, and this is a mouthful, technical solutions architect of worldwide sales, something, 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 but it's really important. Anyways, Jason, I kind of gave you the, everyone the, the, the highlights. Tell us more about who you are, maybe personally, maybe about Metal DevOps. Go. Ooh, okay. Well, so personally, I am a diehard metal fan, it is alluded to in a lot of the Twitter uh, and, and conversations that we've had publicly in the past. Uh, as far as uh, metal DevOps, that's something that kind of was, was born from, you know, somebody asking me where my, where my video blog is, where my regular blog is, where's my website, my YouTube channel, and all these other things. And I thought about it, and, uh, you know, I didn't have one. So I'm like, well, if I were to do something, what would I do? You know, here me being me, I figured I'd break out uh, my love for, for metal uh, and then technology, right? So, you know, it started off where, what would I even call this thing? And then the first thing that popped in my head for some reason or another was Metal DevOps. So I started a hashtag and that somehow sparked a following and uh, I got people promoting it. We haven't even started with the show yet, but it's, uh, it's going to be really <laughs> awesome. I'm, I'm super excited about it. Sorry, Jason, I was going to ask you, have you got a date yet? I mean, we're putting the pressure on you here to, you know, get it started. So, so no real firm date yet, but uh, I've got some, some pretty good uh, people coming over to jump on video with me and right. maybe kick it off properly. Uh, biggest thing is trying to get the lighting and the camera set up in the basement here in the studio and make sure it looks good and, um, and run through a couple of test, uh, test uh, episodes and then make sure it works. And then once I do that, uh, I think the other thing is trying to find a home, whether it's, it sounds like YouTube might be the best and easiest way to go. Um, but I just got to get a little bit of experience with that because I'm, I'm new to this. Uh, so bear with me as, a, as we start to uncover what Metal DevOps really is. <laughs> well, any help, you know, you know, you know where, where to find, find us. Hey, we, we and I appreciate that. that, I do. Um, so just before we move on, I want to know, so this Metal DevOps thing, is it going to be you playing music and then talking about DevOps? Is that what we're kind of... Wait so so yeah, I think so. But then even more so, uh, other things, right? So I figure we'll we'll start off. Maybe we'll have an intro and an outro of some live music, and then we'll talk about some sort of technology. Now, I, I started off with with DevOps because it's the first thing that popped in my head. Because you know, obviously, I spent a lot of time in the DevNet zone with my friends over there, and uh, I was thinking about it. And like, so I, I think it might be a mixture, though. It might be similar to kind of what you guys are doing, but different technologies bringing on different guests each week. Uh, it's not. This is Jason. Everybody, look at Jason. It's it's kind of about just sharing the love for metal and and technology. And it's interesting when I talk to folks who are in IT, especially in, in, in networking. It seems like there's a lot of folks who are metalheads. So I figured, well, why not bring all these different metalheads together in a new community, and then just talk about whatever they know, right? And just kind of share that information. And you know, I, I figure quick hit, maybe 10, 15 minute videos here and there, and um, nothing too super um, detailed. But uh, again. Fun, fun and full of metal. Well, I think anytime you can um, talk about IT, which is one of your big passions, but also pair that with another hobby, such as music, which is always a big thing, it, it just produces an amazing product. So I think it's gonna be fun. I can't wait to see that. Um, now, wh what I wanna bring in first, we'll talk about all kinds of things, because you're known for SD-WAN, you're known for programmability, you're, you're known for just a ton of things. But first, I wanna know, how did you get here? How did you become the Jason Gooley we see right now? Um, because, I mean, you, you've done so much. You, you, you have one of the main books on network programmability. So if people want to get into that, you, they buy your book. And it was Cisco Press, right? Correct, correct. Okay, so how, how did you get to this point? Where was your start? And I know it's a loaded question. Go. Do, if you have time, <laughs> we're going to go into it. Um, so it was an interesting path for me growing up. Uh, um, I, <laughs> I did, not, not from the very beginning, Jason. <laughs> let's, let's start off back in the day with luge lessons. You were born, and, no. and then so, something happened. So I was born, and then 
and then I, I how did your parents transform directly into this. <laughs> how did their parents so, meet? <laughs> no, so it was it was quite interesting. Um, I'll just flash forward to when I was about a teenager, um, uh, and in that in that time, uh, it was really interesting. I was just kind of doing really a whole lot of nothing. I was kind of uh, you know working on building houses and things like that. As a young, it's interesting as a young age, I was I was kind of doing foreman stuff and building houses and just kind of you know messing around and just doing different jobs. And as my, a teenager, as a teenager, it was crazy. I started into it really young, and uh, what was really wow, I was playing. I was playing Call of Duty while you were building yeah. houses. My well, gosh, I, mean, no, I, I did do Duke Nukem and Doom and, and Wolfenstein and all that back in the day too. Um, but I, I started building houses, which was really strange at like 14 years old, and um, I just really loved, enjoyed working with wood and everything. And um, so then I started doing that. My best friend came to me one day and he said, "Hey, man, you should you should learn DOS with me." And I'm like, "What?" Like he's like. It's like, yeah, it's like it's on a computer and you can use this thing. It's, you can type stuff in and then it does stuff. And I'm like, no, I'm good, man. I'm like, I, <laughs> I have really no desire to do that. But incidentally, I just picked up this go-kart that doesn't run. Let's try to get that thing working. So he hawing over this go-kart for a few months. Uh, we're trying to get this thing running. It, literally, it ran one time. Uh, I poured some ether into it and I started it. And it flipped over, landed on the engine and never ran again. So, so months go by and my friend, he keeps pegging me, hey, you really need to learn DOS and check this out. There's this thing called Windows 3.1 and Windows 3.1.1 for work groups and all this cool stuff and Novell. And I'm like, what are you I mean, you're speaking another language to me. I really have no idea what you're even saying. He's like, just come over one day. I'm like, all right. So I go over there, fast forward, and he starts showing me all these things. Next thing you know, I'm 14 years old. He's 13, mind you. You're younger than me. And he's showing me QBasic. I'm... I'm Building circles that make you know siren noises woo, that do absolutely nothing but in QBasic. So I'm I'm 14. Like, this is crazy. You now, so his mom was a computer analyst, and he used to kind of quote unquote steal or borrow her books and stuff all the time and learn, and then basically start working on her computer all the time. So next thing you know, I'm talking to his mom one day, and she goes, "You know, I really noticed you've taken a, a, a shining to this computer as a technology." How about I do you a favor? And I'm like, okay. She's like, I will give you a brand new computer if you give my boyfriend that go-kart that you can't get running. <laughs> and I'm sitting there thinking, I'm like, that is the weirdest, the weirdest thing I've ever heard, you know? At this time, I'm 15 years old, and I've got a, it's a go-kart. I'm 15, so I'm like, you know, like, part of me was like, no way. And, uh, <laughs> and, and, and then I start, I'm sitting there thinking, I'm like, well, the thing doesn't run anyway. Sure. So I, I traded her for a brand new computer. It was a, at that time, I think it was a 486SX16 with four meg of onboard RAM, if I remember right. Ooh. And here I had this brand new computer. And it was the craziest thing. So then all of a sudden, you know, me and my friend here were, were building and fixing computers. Now, and what it, year was this? This was, this had to be like 96. 1996. Oh, so, so you were, that was like the best time. Dude, it was, about, you were just it getting was in the, way back the in the day. Yeah. Oh my gosh. I, I had a flowing head of hair. I'm not kidding you. Flowing <laughs> head of hair. And one of these days I'll flash up some pictures. Uh, that'll be part of the Metal Dev Ops piece. But um, so next thing you know, me and him have a business at 15 and 16 years old building and selling computers. So oh, it's, wow. it's crazy. It was the weirdest thing ever, man. I, I couldn't even get through high school, you know, properly. And I'm, I'm over here building and selling computers with my own business. It was wild. Were you a good student? Uh, oh, no, no, no. <laughs> I was not. Uh, being completely transparent, I, I, um, I ended up having to get out of high school and get my good enough diploma. So I know there's a lot of uh, a lot of folks who've gone down that path, and a lot of it had. Yeah, I mean, cause I'll be honest. I su I sucked in high school. I mean, sucked. I, horrible. It was not my thing. Horrible, and and a lot of it was, you know, think about this, you know, mid '90s, the 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 era of uh, you know gangster rap and all this good stuff going on, and <laughs> here I am, you know, slanging computers and stuff, uh, legally, mind you. Um, and you know, it was just it was just it was just it was just one of those things where it was like. You know, I, I, it just wasn't fitting in right in, in high school for me. And, and they were doing stuff that I, I was, frankly, not interested in. I was more interested in technology and computers and all these other things. And they didn't have anything like that, when, you know, when I was going to school. So I just kept doing it, right? And uh, I got my, my, I called my good enough diploma or my, my GED. And then um, I, I, I started getting, a, I got a job working at, this is hilarious, I was a repo man for a, a furniture rental company. And... That paid for me to continue going to school, and 
Then, next thing you know, they started renting out the old Packard Bell computers, if you remember those things, with the orange and the, the green mouse and keyboard uh, stuff and the weird speakers that hung on the side. So I was this repo guy. I think I saw that in the museum once. Yeah, yeah, the museum, yeah. See? <laughs> it's, just, it's as old as my hair. And um, so then I, I started doing all this, and that next thing you know, I was building and fixing computers at this rental place as well as a repo man. And then uh, things kind of just went out, you know, just kind of started growing on their own. I started getting jobs at different places doing things in the networking. And I really fell in love with it. And then I heard about this thing called Cisco. And at this point, Ooh. this is 97, 1997. How old, how old were you around that time, Jason? I was young. I was probably about uh, 17 or 18. Well, that's great. I mean, so you heard about Cisco, you know, still, still in your teens. Yes. And... Um, it was, it was awesome, right? So I heard about this thing, and then the only thing that they had back then was they had this thing called Boson Router Simulator, and then they had oh, yeah. they had the Cybex CCNA Study Kit written by Todd Lamley. And I'm like, oh, that's awesome, you know? And um, all I know is that everybody said, you know, I was talking to this one, fo- this one group of people, and they're like, you know, if you get your CCNA, you'll make a quarter of a million dollars a year. And I'm like, oh, that's awesome, you know? That sounds great. <laughs> but yeah, but then there's this thing called the CCNP, and if you get that, you're making like $370,000 a year. And I'm sitting there like, what? And then they're like, but then there's this thing called the CCIE. There's like less than 500 of them in the world. And if you get this, you make more than the president. And I'm like, <laughs> that's it. That's what I'm going to do. I want my CCIE. And then one day I'm going to go work for Cisco. That's what I'm going to do. That's it. So I got this stuck in my brain. And I'm like, this is my path. This is what I'm going to do. So I go to school at this vocational uh, school, and um, if you got a second, I'm gonna show you a picture. This is hilarious. Oh, we got plenty of time for I this. I keep this here because it makes me laugh. I went to this vocational school, and here I oh, am wow. in the zoot suit with the black and white wingtips, standing in front of this school on graduation day, because for some reason <laughs> I thought that this suit was going to be the the, the epicenter of <laughs> of what I should be dressed like <laughs> back when I was 17 or 18 years old. Uh, you know, with, if you could tell, full head of hair, long ponytail, slick back was fantastic. Side shaved off and everything. Oh. Um, so I went and I graduated this school, and it was funny enough, graduated top of my class. And what it was is that it was Microsoft certification for, you know, uh, Windows and, and Office and all this good stuff. A plus certification back in the day when it was DOS and jumper jumper settings and dip switches and all that good fun stuff. <laughs> and then uh, I, I studied and I got my CNA in Novell. So funny enough was they didn't do anything with Cisco, but I wanted to continue down the networking path. So I started learning Novell because that was something that was really hot at the time. So back in the day, to, to age myself even further, it was Novell and 411B, if that, if that makes any, anybody happy. Um, <laughs> So I got through this and I'm like, but dude, I want to do Cisco. What the heck? There's nothing really out there for Cisco. And that was kind of the beginning of eBay. If you think back, this was like the beginning of eBay. And uh, I jump on eBay and they had CCNA study kits that you could buy. It was three 2501 routers with the 60 pin serial connections back to back with these little AUI adapters and 1900 series switches and all this funky stuff. I'm like, this is fantastic. It's like six grand. I'm like, dad, dad. I need six grand, you know, and, and my dad, you know, he's a very practical person. Um, I, I grew up my whole life. My dad was a landscaper and, uh, you know, he, he owned his own business and stuff like that. And he came to me and, and he was also very militant in the sense that he was in the Navy. And he, he really basically came out and was like, you know, either if you're messing around, we're not going to do anything. If you aren't messing around, then, then we'll consider it. So I was like, no, dad, I really think that this is something I want to do. I, 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 I love it. And I haven't even started it yet. You know, he's like, Okay. And sure enough, like a month later, these things probably came from, from China or something, like a month later, <laughs> this probably gray market Cisco equipment shows up at my door and I had no idea what to do with it. And this, this stuff had like iOS 10 on it. It was so old. Um, but I got all this stuff and I'm like, this is fantastic. I'm going to start messing with it and doing stuff. And, and I just went through the uh, Boson simulator that I had in that Cybex book. And I just started trying to build stuff that I found in the book in this actual equipment. And next thing you know, I was, I was, I was labbing. I was labbing for the first time, and it was just so fun. And uh, I just kept doing it. And I kept doing it, and I kept doing it. And then I think it was 99, 99 I got my CCNA. And then uh, it was, oh, 
01 or 02 that I went and I got my CCNP. And uh, then I'm like, okay, well, I guess the next logical step here is I got to get my CCIE, right? <laughs> I'm just going to go take it and get it. So I went and I took the written and I passed, which was amazing. You know, I was really excited about that. And I'm like, well, I guess the only thing left to do is schedule a lab exam. So I, I went through and, and bummed some more money for my, for my parents. I said, hey, I need to, <laughs> need to schedule this lab exam. And it, by, back then it was, I don't even, I think it was only either, it was either, I think it was 1200 bucks back then. So I'm like, all right, well, I'm going to do this. I schedule it and I walk in there like, all right, man, this is it. I'm going to pass my CCIE first try. I'm going to be that guy who gets it in the point, point zero, whatever, 3%. That's going to be me. So I walked in there. Bam! It just desecrated me, man. <laughs> so I get back up and I, all I could do was like kind of, I felt like I needed to dust myself off. I was like, look around. I was like, Pff. me? 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 <laughs> Y'all made the test wrong. <laughs> me? <laughs> 30 days later, wham! Right on my butt again. Now, mind you, this is hilarious. I've done nothing in between those 30 days to change anything. So I'm like, 30 days later, took it again. <laughs> and this is version 3.0 back in the day, right? And uh, this is, it's, it's still a two, two day exam, uh, or I'm, uh, yeah, I'm sorry, a one day exam. Um, but it was, it was version 3.0 and I'm sitting there like, I don't know what to do. You know, I, 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 I've, I, I don't understand why I'm not passing and all these other things. And so finally I'm like, all right, I'm going to, I'm going to really going to dive in deep. This was, you know, like I came to I and E and all these folks last, right. It was one of those things where I kind of did the tour, the, uh, tour, the, providers for for workbooks and everything like that and, and rack time and and um after all this time you know i, I really it kind of came down to sitting down with a couple of folks who who really were trainers in the industry who said you got to slow down and i was like what do you mean slow down you know and a lot of it it, it hit me because one day i was doing this lab and i was sitting there in this class and i was trying to I was trying to go through this lab and I configured this stuff and it wasn't working. So I called the teacher over and I'm like, look, I know I configured this BGP right. I know I did, but it's not working. And he's like, well, show me the configuration. I'm like, I'm show him the configuration. He's like, well, why'd you configure it on router three? And I'm like, because it, and it was like router one and I put it on the wrong router, right? So it was just, you get stuck in lab mode where you just go task after task after task after task. And sometimes you just need to look up a little bit from the lab guide and see what you're really doing. Because yeah. I that was an eye-opening thing for me, that I just needed to slow down and reread everything that I was doing. And it would have been a lot better, right? And there's some there's a really good friend of mine out there. His name is Terry Vinson. So I have to call out to him uh, because he helped me out uh, when I decided to go back and start taking it again. So 3.0, I'm like, all right, I'm going to take it again. They changed it to 4.0. So then they added on like all this other stuff like MPLS and all these crazy things. And at the time, MPLS was was foreign to me and I, I just I was definitely afraid of it, which most people were at the time and, and probably still are. Um, and I'm going through and I, I got to the point where like, I know MPLS, I've, I've got this down, you know. And I took the exam version 4.0 and I got 50% on troubleshooting and, and I failed config. And I'm like, okay, well, I, I'm getting there. And then I went and I looked. I'm like, well, I only finished five questions in troubleshooting. So I'm like, I got 50%. I only did five or only completed five because I ran out of time at the time. So I'm like, perfect, dude. I'm doing really good. So then I go back and I'm, I'm studying with, with, with Terry. And um, he, he built this MPLS lab for me. He says, all right, you have three minutes to find the problem, three minutes to fix it. I'm like, all right. So then he gives me controls back on a WebEx and boom, I tear off and I start find, find it in like 30 seconds, find the issue, fix the problem. He goes, all right, cool. You failed. And I'm like, <laughs> like what? He's like, he's like, what was the problem? And, and, and this is just a lab me and him were doing so I could tell you. It was like, oh, I, I, on the P router in the middle, no MPLS LDP advertised labels was on. And obviously that breaks your, your label path. He's like, all right, cool. He's like, what'd you do to fix it? I'm like, I turned it back on, you know, MPLS LDP advertised labels. He's like, he's like, you failed. 
And I, for the longest time, I couldn't figure out what he was talking about. I'm like, what? I fixed the problem. I got into end reachability. It's, it's working. He's like, what did that do to the config? And I sat back in my chair and I thought about it. I'm like, well, you know, the command no MPLS LTP advertised labels was in the config. And when I re-enable it, it takes that out of the config. He's like, you removed config. What could you have done instead of removing config to fix that problem? And I sat back in my chair and I'm like, are you freaking kidding me? I said, I could have done MPLS LDP advertised labels to access list, boom, blah, blah. And he goes, why didn't you do that? I go, who in the heck would? And, you know, I'm like, who would in their first, you know, city, who would do that, right? And that was eye-opening to me. So then I go, I'm like, all right, I'm going to take it again. So I go, I take it. I complete nine out of 10 tasks in the, in the, in the uh, troubleshooting. I got 45% and I passed config. So I failed. I'm like, what? It just didn't make any sense. So then finally, I'm like, all right, I've got to, I'm doing something wrong, clearly. And um, I was like, I'm going to try one more time. And I went back and I nailed it. And I think the biggest thing when you're, when you're studying for certifications, when you're going for lab exams, is, is to really take stock into what it is you're doing at the time. Because I remember sitting there the, the last time I actually passed, I was sitting there. And I remember just, you, you're, you're worn down. You're in there for eight hours. You're, you're exhausted. And we had this, it was the worst scenario possible in this case. They, the, lab, the lab itself, and I don't mean uh, lab scenario, but I mean the, the day of the lab. Because I remember we got there, we're sitting in the, in the lobby at like in RTP at seven o'clock in the morning. And they come out and they say, unfortunately, our AD crashed. So nobody can log into the labs. So we have to get this up and working. So I'm like, okay, and then I'm sitting there, and you got everybody sitting there chewing their fingernails off, tapping, doing all this stuff, freaking out in the lobby there, and I'm like, man, all right, I'm, I'm just trying to keep my composure. People are chain smoking cigarettes out front. I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, I'll just, I'll just be all right, you know. So then they come back and they said it's going to be longer. It's going to be longer. They, I'm not even kidding you. Came out at 1 p.m. and said they got it up and working, and it's, uh, it's up to us if we want to take the lab exam, or get a voucher. To go back, to go back and uh, and take it a different day. So I'm like, you know, I'm here. I, you know, I'm, I'm here to power through it, dude. And uh, you know, they're, they're they're letting you eat at your desk. They're giving you like cookies and all kinds of weird junk and pop and stuff. It's so unusual of a situation that how that was. It was so crazy. So then, so I get out of there. I I, I finished the lab, and you know, the last couple times I went and took it, I brought my wife with me, and it was, in my mind, it was like kind of helping me relax you know she she kept me calm because usually the night before you're laying there your head's full you can't sleep you're 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 sweating you're like what's going on you're thinking of all these different configurations in your brain and and so I brought my wife with me and believe it or not that kept me kept me pretty calm and then I was able to sleep and then in the morning you know I woke up she gave me a ride over to the exam place and dropped me off and so here it is day of I I take this exam and then I get done and I happen to know the proctor at the time and he, he tells me, hey, you know, hang, hang tight for a minute. I'm like, all right. So I'm waiting. And then there's another guy. He says, hang tight. I'm like, all right. No, at this time, I did not work at Cisco. I was, I was a customer. And the other guy uh, worked at Cisco. So we're sitting there hanging out in this lunchroom. And the guy walked off and disappeared. So we're, me, and, <laughs> me and this other guy, his name is Don, we're, we're, we're hanging out in this lunchroom for like an hour. And then this dude comes back and he says, so you want to know if you passed or not? And I'm like, yeah and he goes to don he goes got another 1500 bucks and then don's like oh no and he just goes like this and he goes to shake his hand and he passed so i'm like oh that, that was so devilish <laughs> it was it was so evil for him to even do that you know and then he looked at me he goes so you want to know and i go i go yeah and he you know and he just kind of went like this and i'm like oh man and then he just went like that and stuck his hand out and i was like you're kidding me i picked this guy up i was so excited man i was freaking out man I was freaking out. So I ended up passing. And by the time we figured out what our numbers were, the guy who, who he shook his hand first got the number right before mine. So I'm 38,759. He's 38,758. And I've never met anybody that had numbers one off from each other before. So who actually took it sat the same day. So it was really neat. So me and him are pretty tight friends now. And um, <laughs> I got out of there and my wife comes walking up and I wave her over and I go, how's 38,759 sound? And the curse words that came out of her mouth were just tremendous. It was like the whole, every people in the parking lot turn around looking like, what, what is wrong with, what's going on here? She jumps up, gives me this big old hug and 
There it is, thirty-eight seven fifty-nine, and um, from See, there, I'm not sure my wife would appreciate it if oh, I passed the CCA. Oh, oh man, <laughs> I think she was just happy. She's like, okay, now instead of you telling me you have to study, you can spend some time. Now with the oh band. yeah, you get your life back. Get my That's life what... back, right? <laughs> that didn't exactly pan out the way I uh, anticipated. So I get that thing, and I pass March 29th, twenty thirteen, and. I'm working as a as a customer and um, now hold on real quick. Yeah. I want to backtrack because sure. we, so we're, we're 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 seeing the CCIE journey. But where were you working? And when did you get your first job? So very very good point. So my first job actually started when I was like 15. Um, when I was 17, um, I was actually first job was 15. I was working at McDonald's. This is kind of hilarious. Um, <laughs> I'm sitting there serving food out of the drive thru thinking. I really want to do uh, other stuff with my life. Um, so, but I was doing it. And it's then, a big uh, motivator at McDonald's, yeah. It, it, it was, it, you know, was, I started there and um, I remember the, the, the deciding factor to leave there was I had a, I had a person come through the drive-thru who was extremely rude to me one day and uh, they wanted an ice cream cone. And, uh, you know, here I am, I'm 15. You know, like I said, I was, uh, I was a little shaky back then, you know. So, um, I'd make this guy an ice cream cone, and I, I hand him the ice cream cone, and he's like, oh, that, that doesn't pan out. I've been waiting for five minutes in this drive-thru. That, that just doesn't pan out. And I'm like, and he hands this ice cream cone back to me. I'm like, what What do you mean it doesn't pan out? It's, it's an ice cream cone. I don't want to. And then I'm like, well, all right. <laughs> uh, so I took the ice cream cone, made him a new one, and I just go, boom. I made him this ice cream cone. That thing, I mean, I can't even get on the camera. That thing had to be 18 inches tall. I'm not even kidding you. I just kept making it bigger, this big old ice cream cone. So I bring this ice cream cone to him. I had to turn it sideways to get it through the window. I give this ice cream. He's like, yeah, that's more like it. That's what I'm talking about. Grabs this ice cream cone, and I don't know what the guy was thinking, but he grabbed the ice cream cone, and he yanks it into his car. So... <laughs> So, so it, it hits the top of his door and falls like this. Half of it goes down the outside of his door. The other half uh, lands in his lap. And instinctively, I'm laying on the floor in the drive through window crying because I'm laughing so hard at this, this poor guy, <laughs> thinking karma, how fast karma could return at that point. And uh, at that point, I was like, you know, I knew I was probably, I was probably out of there. So I, I just kind of you know, put in my notice and uh, said thanks for everything, got my free employee value meal and skedaddled out the door. <laughs> uh, um, but then again, yeah, so uh, I then went, you know, started doing different odd jobs and uh, building houses and things like that and then ended right. up at that, that furniture place, you know, repoing people and working on computers. And then as the time, time went on, I kept getting different jobs in technology. One was at a wire factory. They made all the wiring harnesses for the big John Deere tractors that you see out in the, in the farm fields. So they yeah. made all these different wiring harnesses and I was responsible for their entire IT network. So I was doing all that. And I just kept kind of just jumping from job to job from when I say that, I mean, from an experience perspective, I kept gaining experience and doing more uh, valuable jobs in my mind. So I, I kept managing networks and doing different things like working on data centers. Then it was helping build data centers and all these other things. And, and did you I, have your CCNA before you got your first network job? Yes, so I did. So I, I had my CCNA, and then uh, actually at the point at that point I had my CCNA, and um, at the time, you know, it was one of those things where I, I don't want to say age discrimination, but if if somebody looked at you in the '90s and you had a long ponytail and the side of your heads were shaved off, and you had a CCNA, and you're like, I'm here to run your network. Most of the time, they did, they didn't that should want, be a meme. Yeah, I'm going to make that a meme. Can I get that photo sent yes. to me? I, I'm, here to, I'm, I'm here to help you run your network, and they're like, "Yeah, right." You know, and, and a lot, it was really hard at the time to get a job, and and this was this was it was it was very interesting because it was really hard to get into to break into the networking because nobody wanted to give you an opportunity, and then finally I got like I said I got to that wiring company uh, because it was here local, and I showed them what I knew, and they were impressed and they hired me and gave me an opportunity and once I got that opportunity I just kept growing within the different roles and then you know I got my was it, was it your first admin job period like had you have you done any other no, Windows admin job at all no at that point and it was uh, it, that was my first admin job wow. and uh, and it was it was it was kind of interesting because it was I was not only I knew I knew the Windows piece of it uh, they didn't have Novell. Sadly enough, uh, nobody did really after that. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, now it just hangs on the wall and does nothing. But uh, uh, it was my first admin job, and, and it was 
it was Windows admin, then it was A plus certification stuff. So I'm building and repairing computers all the time. I was also running, I was helping them run the help desk. There's only two folks. And I was the server guy and I was the network guy. So I really was thrown into a whole bunch of different kinds of technology all at once. And, uh, you know, my dad was in the phone company uh, when I was, before I was born and in the Navy, he was a phone guy. So he taught me a bunch of voice. I mean, when I say voice, I mean, TDM old school voice. Right. And right. Uh, I, I ended up doing some of that stuff for those, those guys as well. And, and it was just, it was fascinating and I loved it. And then, you know, one day I got this job and it was as a consultant for State Farm. And I was like, well, this sounds awesome, you know, and it was literally traveling around to install, at, the, at this time it was Compaq Net Servers, or H, yeah, Compaq Net Servers, I think they were, or HP Net Servers, ProLiance, way back in the day. Old school mm -hmm. tower servers and, and installing those at all the claims offices at, at State Farm. I'm like, oh, well, what the heck, you know, let's, let's do it. And it was more money at the time, and I'm like, oh, I'm interested in this, and I started traveling. So here I am, like 17, 18 years old, I'm starting to travel. I'm going all over the place in the Midwest just for State Farm. And then the next thing you know, they're like, well, we really want you to replace this old router. You no, know, we have like a 2600 sitting here. We want you to replace it with this new one. I'm like, okay, and started doing things like that. And then it was, I think it was the 3640s back then. And I just kept doing different things. And then lo and behold, uh, I got a job at Allstate Insurance, which is kind of a complete opposite, but uh, I got a job through a company. If you remember this, I know David remembers this. Sorry, Chuck. Sorry, Chuck. But <laughs> David remembers everything know, all the time David over there. I know remembers this. <laughs> Wang Global. Do you remember Wang Global? There was a computer company called Wang Global. It was a big consulting company. And, uh, Is that a U.S. company? Yeah, yeah, it was global, but uh, um, yeah. but it was it was a big company. And that eventually, I think they ended up partnering with uh, Perot Systems and some other things like that. But um, so I ended up working at this called company called Wang Global and got hired into Allstate. Next thing you know, I'm, I'm helping run things in the network. I'm, I'm running all kinds of desk side stuff when it comes to uh, wiring for switching and all these other things. And it just kind of kept going and it was fantastic. And um, at that point in time, I, I knew that I was, I was on to something, right? I was doing pretty good at the time. And, you know, it was, uh, I was. Now, did, you just, did you just have your CCNA or were you at, about at to that point, I, At that point, I had my CCNP. So I got my okay. NP in 02. So I think I started working there right about, right about then. So it was fantastic. So I kept doing these things. And then um, 2004 came around and a buddy of mine called me up and he said, have you ever heard of that, that uh, carpet company in Chicago called Empire? And I'm sitting there, I'm like, I'm like you know, 5882300 Empire? They're like, oh, yeah. They're like, yeah. He's like, <laughs> he's like dude, uh, they, they offered me a job there, but I, I can't take it um, because I, I've got this other commitment. He's like, do you want me to give him your name? And I'm like, Heck yeah, dude, that sounds fantastic. I'm like, I grew up listening to this this jingle my whole life. So I'm like, all right, yeah, why not? So they, they call me, and I go into this interview, and here's this bobblehead sitting there of the Empire guy. And I'm like, I'm just, I'm like starstruck because I'm like, oh, man, <laughs> if you're from Chicago, you know the Empire guy, and, and you know the jingle, and you know, you know, it's just part of your childhood growing up, and it was fantastic. So I'm like, yes, this is awesome. They come in, they go, so we need somebody to do uh, some some desk side uh, help desk stuff and and re respond to uh, entry level network issues and I'm like, I'm like sure, you know why not? What the heck, you know? I'll do it. And then uh, they're like, you know, I know you have your CCNP and everything like that, so we want you to get into that as well. But you know, essentially we're gonna we're gonna bring you in as like a, a desk side liaison between, you know, help desk and the network team. I'm like, perfect. So, so you felt you were definitely overqualified for that, but you way, were willing to take that way, risk because it was a bigger company at, the, at that point. Mm -hmm. and, and the funny thing is, as you come, as I came to find out in all the years I spent there, is that when I started there, I was more certified than anybody else who even worked there, including the senior engineers. And uh, but I, I didn't care at the time. I was like, you know what, you know, what? I'm just going to keep doing this and see where it leads me. And next thing you know, I remember I was I was I was helping. This guy out, uh, he has had some issues with some wireless. And I was sitting next to him and I was like, well, I, I know how to do all this. I can help you with it. And he kind of looked at me like, you know, who's this young whippersnapper, you know? And I was like, look, no, seriously. And I configured, you know, so at this, in this point, wireless was autonomous back then with, with Cisco Wireless. You had to configure each access point individually. So I helped him do all these different things. And the next thing you know, it was like, oh, okay. And, um, <laughs> I, I just kind of kept growing, and then uh, I, I became the, a network engineer. 
on the team. Uh, and then next thing you know, this gentleman, he just quit. And uh, he, d he left. So so here comes my boss at the time holding, holding this guy's badge and his cell phone in his hand, like white as it goes, freaking out, like, oh my gosh, the senior network engineer just walked out, you know? And I'm, I sit there looking, but I'm like, oh, it's, it's all good. I, I know all this stuff. And he's like, what do you mean? You, you, you know all this stuff? I'm like, yeah, I've been kind of telling you for a, quite a long time, a year or so at least now that I know how to do all these different things. I'm certified in it and we're good. I can, I can handle it. And uh, he kind of looked at me and he's like, okay. And then that, that was basically the start of me doing everything at, at this company alone. So I, it was just a team of one. I ended up managing, running everything that was, was um, Cisco. And then I had a folks uh, eventually start reporting to me. I ended up becoming the uh, senior network engineer. Then I was the network communications manager. And then I was on deck to actually be the director of network communications. And Golly. then uh, I was literally going for all this stuff. And then I had a team of, I think it was like five or six folks, a really good friend of mine uh, uh, was on my team as well. And we stay in touch. And it just, it just kind of kept going. And the whole time I'm sitting there, I'm studying and going for my CCIE in this process, right? So this is where, this is where, you know, the rubber meets the road, where it really, butt in seat experience and working on these different types of technologies that were far even beyond what I, the scope of the CCIE for what I was doing, right? So I was going route switch. I was working with, with voice. I was working with all the, the firewalls, went from PICs to ASAs. I was doing all the SAN stuff. I was doing data center. Everything you can think of, if it said Cisco on it, contact center I was helping these guys with. It was, it was, it was what my responsibility. And so I, I forged a whole lot of really good relationships with the Cisco folks at the Cisco office back then and multiple different vendors. And, and now, real quick, I, 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 I don't want to get too far without knowing this. Now, sure. when, you, when you told your boss that you were the guy, like you knew everything that that previous guy knew, did you, did you really believe that or were you just like... I'm going to front until I can be that guy. <laughs> fake, it, fake it until you make it. Um, no, yeah. at, at that point, uh, I really do believe that because, it, you know, it was one of those things where, you know, if I, I had already been gone and had my CCNP and I was starting down the journey of, of, of studying for my CCIE and the things that we were doing uh, in this place at the time, they, they really weren't, it wasn't anything earth shattering as far as complexity goes. So mm. I was like, all right, well, I mean, we're, we're doing some layer three VLAN routing, you know, some access lists, you know, on the edge. There wasn't anything that was really super hypercritical. So I just, you know, I, I just kept going with it, right? And um, what, what was interesting was that, you know, after after we flash forward and, and I go get all this experience and, and I'm helping all these other folks, I, I find myself helping folks learn and start studying for their CCIEs. I wasn't even a CCIE yet. And I was helping people. And it was, it was just something that I really enjoyed doing. It was like a passion of mine to just help people. And then, you know, here, here you go one day, it was uh, March 29th, you know, 2013, I passed that route switch. And I was on deck to be the network communications director at, at this company. And, uh, you know, I, it, it was one of those things where I knew that I had an opportunity in front of me to really expand my horizons from a technology perspective. And I, I had to take it. So I ended up getting intercepted by Cisco. And... Uh, I started July 8th, so it was, it was a quite, a quite an interesting story because here I am, a fresh CCIE, Cisco Live I think was in June in Orlando, and it was my first Cisco Live, I'd never ever been there, and I get hired at Cisco and they're like, okay, you don't start until July 8th, so technically I work at Cisco, but I haven't started yet, I just passed my CCIE and I'm going to Cisco Live for the first time ever, and I'm like... <laughs> <laughs> my, my my brain was just, I mean, I was all over the place. My brain was spinning. I'm like, I had no idea what the future entailed. All I know and is... How much, was, how much hair did you have at the time? Uh, you, a little bit more than this. A little bit more than this. Uh, but, but, not, but not that much. Not that much. Um, the CCIE really took it away from me. That's um, what I figured. Yeah. And uh, So then all this is going, I'm sitting at Cisco Live, first time ever. I'm like, I don't even know where this world is going to take me. And I'm, I'm sitting down in the CCIE lounge, right? Because now that I'm a CCIE, I can go through this little side door and get free chocolate and stuff and, and eat all kinds of cool. <laughs> Makes it all worth oh, it. Oh, right? yeah. I can get all kinds of like, <laughs> like my own bottled water and, and there's some stickers and stuff. I'm like, this is fantastic. And I'm like, I'm on high. This was like the best for me. So I walk in. I'm sitting at this little round little round table in the CCIE lounge. I'm like, 
just eating. I'm like, I can't believe it. I'm like, I'm watching all these people come in. I'm like, oh, I know them. I, I don't know. I'm sitting there, and this gentleman sits down with me at the table with some food, and uh, he just starts talking to me, you know. And, and I, I didn't know who it was, and he's like, so, what's your story? I go, ah, oh, my name's Jason. I just started at Cisco, but I haven't started yet. Uh, I just passed my route switch, hold my badge up. I got my CCIE. I'm so excited. Uh, I have no idea what's going on, but I start work at, at Cisco in like two weeks. He's like, oh, that's fantastic. And he's like, well, what do you think you're going to do next? I'm like, I don't know, man. I think I might get my CCIE for data center because for some reason it's like a tattoo. You get one of these things you want to keep going. I don't know what it is. Um, but I'm like, I like that. But I'm like, I'm like I think I'm going to get data center. And this gentleman, he just kind of sits back and looks at me. He goes, you should get your CCDE. And I'm like, yeah, you, you know, I never really thought of that because at the time that was it wasn't very popular, right? I mean, it was very, very slim. And I was like, well, you know, I, I haven't really thought of that. He's like, but you, you, you should go for your CCD. You go for design. It'll, it's, it'll be good. I'm like, all right, well, yeah, I'll, I'll keep that in mind and think about it, you know? And I, he's like, if you ever decide to go for your CCDE, you give me a call. I'm like, okay, cool. And I'm like, who are you, right? Like, I didn't know who it was. So he flips his badge up, and I go, and I take a picture of his badge, and it's Russ White. So here's, <laughs> here's Russ White, CCDE, CCIE, CCAR. I'm like... Holy moly, I've been sitting here talking to Russ White for like an hour. This is crazy. <laughs> and uh, and it, as, we're, as we're chatting, uh, and me feeling completely sheepish and foolish that I didn't recognize who he was, uh, this other gentleman comes up and starts talking to us, and it's Bo Williamson. Here's Mr. Multicast walks up, and I'm just like, this is crazy, man. I've read your book. This is so crazy. So that was the start. Cisco Live, completely deer in headlights, had no idea what was going on, hadn't even started Cisco yet. And um, I didn't even know what I was going to do. You know, all I know is that I was going to get my CCIE and I was going to go work at Cisco. And that was something I've been saying since I was really young. So, and it happened, and it was crazy. You know, and next thing you know, it, it really took on a life of its own. It, you know, I, I started off as an SE at Cisco, and uh, they wouldn't even give me accounts yet because I didn't have any pre-sales experience. So when I started, it was one of those things where it's like, you know. We, we want to train you and send you to all these trainings to make sure you understand what you know how to talk about pre-sales. It's different than post-sales. You're not trying to actually fix anything. You're, you're trying to design networks, essentially, for customers. So I'm like, all right. So then, like, three months go by, and, you know, I'm th sitting there thinking, I'm like, all right, well, I still don't have an account yet. I don't know if I'm going to be around here pretty soon. And, um, and things just slowly started picking up. I ended up shadowing people on their accounts next thing you know i ended up with like 15 or 18 accounts and i was i was doing my own thing and it was awesome you know then you know iwan came out there was this whole concept of iwan and i was doing a lot of different <laughs> stuff with uh with enterprise networking and, and routing and switching and and as the time went on i was being called into all these different uh se's accounts to be an, technically like an overlay to help about with complex routing and design issues and, um, you know, so I'm doing all this stuff. iWAN comes out. I'm on the, end up on the worldwide adoption team driving iWAN for Cisco and doing a whole bunch of different design technology and, and stuff like that, drawing it all together. And, and my boss at the time comes up to me. He goes, I've got this idea. And I'm like, what is it, man? What's up? And he goes, you should go for your CCD. And I'm like, wait a minute. <laughs> what? Where the heck did that come from? He's like, no, man, it's perfect. Nobody in all of the Midwest in, 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 at Cisco and commercial have their CCDE. You would be the first. We'll pay for everything. You should go get your CCDE. And I'm like, you know, I've heard this before. I'm like, let me, you'll pay for everything? He's like, we'll pay for everything. I'm like, all right. So I reach out to Russ. I'm like, Russ, hey, uh, they want me to go for my CCDE. And that was it. Next thing you know, I'm I'm in the trenches studying for my CCDE and going through all that, helping with all this design stuff and all these different customers. And um, a buddy of mine reaches out, Brian McGann, he reaches out to me and he says, hey man, you know, if you're really going for your CCDE, you could probably take your CCIE service provider with little to no effort, because you need to know all that stuff anyway, and walk away with a new CCIE. I'm like, yeah, I never really thought of that. Um, but, you know, my wife, I'm pretty sure would just disown me uh, if, if I if I went through and I and I went for another CCIE 
She's like, oh, you, you don't have to tell her. I'm like, oh, she'll know. She'll know. I'm like, uh, and I won't be there. I'll be in a dungeon in the basement somewhere for, you know, weeks on end and months on end. So I, I brought it to my wife. She said, okay, last CCIE. And I said, okay. And I, I studied Liar. for it. I studied for it. And the funny thing is this attempt versus any other attempt uh, was totally different for me. And in this case, I was going for my CCDE. So my brain was set on CCDE. That was my goal. And here I was, you know, it was the end of, it was the end of, I think, 2014. And um, they said, you know, we're changing the CCIE to version 4.0 or CCIE service provider version 4.0. And I'm like, oh man, then there was no lab dates available. So I'm like, oh dude, this totally stinks. I've been studying for like six months and there's no there's no lab dates. And then one day one popped up on January 29th. Coincidence? Maybe. So January 29th pops up and I book it. So I'm like, all right, well the way I look at it is like this. I'm learning this stuff from my CCDE. If I pass it, that's fantastic, highly doubtful. But if I pass it, cool. If I don't, no worries, no harm, no foul. There's no more dates. I did my best. So I walked in there and I, I, I it was, a, I think the mental difference was I just, I wasn't in it to win it. Like I just went in there like, you know, if I pass, cool. If I don't, yeah. And I passed, which literally floored me. I mean, it so the key me. to passing the CCIE is you, should, you just have don't to not care. care. Don't care. <laughs> just don't care. Especially if it's somebody else paying for the exams. No. Uh, oh, well, even better. Uh, even yeah. better. The first one, I had to pay for all of it out of pocket, um, and uh, it wasn't it wasn't very it wasn't very cost effective, that's for sure. Jason, I, I wanted to ask you, how many times did you fail your first CCIE before you passed? So in, in version four point I, I failed it twice and passed on my third. Yeah. So you've passed on your third time for writing and switch, yeah? And then on, on service provider it was it was oddly enough, strangely enough, the first time. First but, which is still time. still befuddles yeah. me. But the fo the follow on story to that, which was so hilarious, was here I am. I'm in Raleigh. I'm I'm, I've just found I just you know went back to the hotel after taking the exam. I had no idea if I passed or not. I I go out and I eat Mongolian barbecue, which it just was a bad idea. It was a bad idea. So I go out and I have Mongolian bar barbecue with all these jalapenos and all this sriracha and stuff and. And I'm like, all right, I'm cool. And then next thing you know, I get the world's worst heartburn. I'm sitting there like, my, my chest is on fire, right? So I'm like, I got to find ice cream or yogurt or something now. So I'm like driving around frantically in a rental car, and I find this do-it-yourself yogurt shop deal. So I'm like, all right, this is great. I went in there and just, I didn't even pay for it. I just went in there and I just ate all it. And I just started plowing down through some of this yogurt. And the lady's like, what is wrong with you? And I'm like, sorry, horrible heartburn. I'll, I'll, pay, I'll pay for whatever you need, you know? And, um, and so then, emergency it's like a cvs so for yogurt like i needed this otherwise i was not going to make it through uh, so i get all this and next thing you know i'm like i'm relieved everything's great all good i drive back to the hotel i'm sitting in the hotel and i got the email the email comes across and says here's your score report and immediately i kind of was just like oh man because usually score report means you didn't pass right i mean it's it's a score breakdown and um so I clicked it and I went through and I logged in and it was a, it was brutal because you have to know your CSCO uh, you know user ID then you have to know what your written score was then you have to know all, when the date you took the written just to get into the login to see what the heck the oh, results wow. were it was it's brutal when you're going for that man so I finally VPN'd in home RDP to my desktop got all this information VPN into work got the the date I last took the thing got it all in there and it pops up congratulations you passed and I'm sitting there like you have got to be kidding me you've got like all I could do was like I jumped up out of my seat and I just kept jumping up and down like I, I was so crazy <laughs> like I was a little kid man I, I literally <laughs> jumped onto the bed and started bouncing around on the bed and then jumped off like I, like I was jumping on the bed like a little kid it was it was amazing to me right and doing that after having severe heartburn Mongolian barbecue and ice cream that was an even worse decision. <laughs> uh, so, so that that all did not bode very well for me. And um, after I was uh, after I was com done composing myself after that, um, and getting sick, I, I I called my wife and I said, 
uh, yeah, I totally just I totally just threw up, but uh, I passed, and uh, it it was it was worth it, you know. And um, it was so funny, and it's such an embarrassing oh story, gosh. but it's so hilarious, right? It's one of those things that you know we're all human, right? I mean, we we all go through the same thing that everybody else does. We all put our pants on one leg at a time, and you know, once you get to the point where it's like you've achieved your goal, the best thing I can I can say is to move your sights out farther and, and do something else. So at that point, the goal was a DE. I hit a milestone in between there that I, in the likes which I never would have thought I would have passed. I got got it, and then I kept going for my CCDE, and, and, um, and here I am now without a CCDE, but now I have two children. So again, it's one of those things where when you spend too much time at home, um, you know, you, <laughs> you end up having children. So um, no, I, I have two wonderful, beautiful children that um, was, uh, it, was a, it was a very hard road for us to get pregnant. We had to go through a lot of uh, IVF uh, and surgery and, and things like that. Um, but we ended up pregnant and the process of all that is very uh, time consuming and it takes a toll on you. So I had to take a step back from some of the exams and, and things like that to spend some time with my family. And, uh, and every time I, I geared up and I went and took it, uh, it seemed like we were going through trying to get pregnant again. And, it, you know, it, it really does take a lot out of you. So, so it was basically, it was a rough road uh, trying to get pregnant and study for certifications at the time. And so now I'm, I'm kind of getting to the point where I think I might start gearing back up towards it. But I'm also weighing out, you know, um, you know with, with kids and wanting to spend time with your family, it doesn't really make sense for me to dive into another certification right now. So maybe when I get a little bit older, but... Uh, so yeah, it's been, well, I'm, it's I'm, been a road. I'm curious though, at, at this point, I mean, cause you're pretty much, you're, you're the boss, right? I mean, you're the Don. Uh, <laughs> w what would it add to your career to get the CCDE that you don't already have? Or is it just, you want it, you just gotta have it? You know, it's one of those things where uh, I'm really hard at giving up on things and uh, <laughs> really bad. Uh, so it's one of those things where I set my sight on something and I, it's really hard for me to say, I, you know, I quit. But in the same sense, it's like, I don't know necessarily from a work or job or career perspective if if I need it. I mean, because and the reason I say that is, once you go through these things and you learn the best practices of design and you you talk with people like Russ and Andre and Marwan and all these, these, these brilliant folks as far as the CCDE goes, you really, you know that stuff, right? So it's, it's not a matter of like, okay, I didn't study, so now I'm gonna forget what best practice for network design is. It's just, you don't have the certification yet. That's really what it comes down to. And there's a mm. saying that is, you're basically a CCIE before you go in and pass the exam because you're at the best that you'll right. probably be right before you sit that exam. So yeah. for me, I was like, well, I really don't necessarily need it. Um, so yeah, so now it's just gonna be a decision if it's something I wanna to continue to pursue. Um, but I think as of right now, the, the spending time with the children and family is probably the, the top of my list for, for me. But, I don't know if you said it on camera, Jason. How old are your kids? Uh, so I have a four-year-old little girl, and a and tomorrow will be a ten-month-old little boy. Yeah, it's a tough time, you know. It's, I think it's it's always hard with kids because you want to spend time with them, but you also want to do well in your career. It's a difficult thing mm -hmm. to balance. Yeah, it's it's tough. Uh, you know, travel is a little tough too. But the good thing is, like it, my 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 role that I have now, it's so much better than it was before because. Now I might travel somewhere for a week. So I'd go to Cisco Live or something. I might be gone for a week. I come back, I'm good. So I'm, I'm home. Uh, and I work completely from home, so it's fantastic. With before, I might travel somewhere that's only like two and a half hours away, but I have to be there you know, two or three times a week. So by, I end up spending more time away locally when I was doing my previous role than I did even now and I travel globally. So it's, when, they, when it comes down to work-life balance, this is probably the best role for me. Yeah. I mean, what's your experience working from home? I mean, would you recommend that? We, we don't have to get into a big debate about it, but a lot of people who work from home, I mean, say they would never want to go back to a traditional role. What's your take on, you know, working from home? You know, in, in my honest opinion, I think it, it truly and honestly depends on the person. So yeah. I'm a very social person, but I really enjoy working from home because I, I I just get stuff done, you know. You, there's no, there's no side track, side tractions. There's nothing going on. I can get up and go upstairs, and, uh, make lunch, come right back down, downstairs. I can go and jam in the other room and play some guitar, do some <laughs> hit, hit on the drums, work it out, you know. And then 
come back in here and dive into something. There are, there are some folks who need the office environment. They need to have people around them constantly. Um, and with the team that I'm on now, we're so globally dispersed. You know, we, we all kind of do our own thing. And I mean, the nickname of the team is get s done right or get stuff done right so um and that's just that's that's literally because you know we're we're spread out all over the world and we we really do try to make the biggest impact we can on cisco and our customers so i love working from home um where else do you get to have a you know 55 inch teams board sitting on your wall at home and you know all these guitars and cool stuff and i don't know the fact that i can merge those two things together um is, is really good and uh, it's a benefit for me. I wanted to take you back a bit because you mentioned something that I wanted, I've wanted. i been wanting to ask you, but I didn't want to interrupt you because you were flowing really well. You said that you spent $6,000, I think you said, on eBay equipment. So I wanted to ask you, now, what did you get for that? Because a lot of people today, and uh, Chuck, seeing that you called me old, I'm going to flip this round. You know, these <laughs> youngins, these young people of today want everything for free, Jason. Like, I get a lot of complaints, you know, I don't want to spend $200 on viral or whatever. But you spent, in the in the bad old days, you spent six grand. And what did you actually get for that? So it was it was interesting. It was a whole pile of stuff. So it was uh, it was three routers, so three 2501 routers, all these serial 60-pin connections to put them yep. together. Um, they called the AUI adapters for the RJ45 yep. for the 10 meg. And, and then I had, um, I think it was a 1900 switch. It was a 1900 series switch. And then there was like a, there was an Adtran, there was an Adtran um, uh, CS, uh, oh my gosh, uh, CSU DSU that sat on the top of it that you can plug yes. in if you wanted to do all that fun stuff. And then um, really it, that was basically it. I mean, it came with um, all the network cables and things you, you wanted to connect it to, but that was pretty much it. I think it had... It was like four and four or eight and eight on flash and RAM on these things. And that was- Yeah, hold on a minute. So you had three routers and a switch and you paid six grand for it. That, yes, back in the day, yes. And, oh yeah. Wow. Yes, yeah. it was, so it was I, like, I think it's really important to put that in perspective because people today forget how much easy it is. Because today you can, go on an e, you can go on eBay and buy 37.50. I don't know what it's like in the US, $20 or $30 or something. It's oh, yeah. so much easier today. And you had to pay six grand for the privilege of getting into Cisco. And, well, and that was the thing. And, and back then, you know, when you're trying to figure out how to download images and you're trying to figure out how to put code on there, it was, I mean, these things came on CDs and stuff back then. And yeah. then you're trying to figure out, like, what? How do I do all this with this, you know, the crossover Where, cable? Where's the CD slot cable? on the router? Like, what is going on with this thing? Can I just will it to happen and maybe it'll upgrade? But now you can with IBM. No, I'm just kidding. Um, but <laughs> it, it, was, it was tough. And, and, and a lot of the reason was, you know, back then, you know, there wasn't a lot of people going down that path. And the equipment yeah, was yeah. equipment that would be used in a production environment somewhere that was really expensive. So it was it was a lot of money. But, you know, I, I mean, I got to be honest with you, when, it, when I got that, it was it was a game changer for me because then I could actually yeah. see what was going on. And then, well, and you, you, you work with GNS3 as well yourself and, yeah. um, you know, having having access to, to viral things like GNS3, all that virtual uh, stuff really does make our lives a lot easier, but that that none of that existed. Well, VMware wasn't even a thought back then, you know. Yeah. So it's like showing our age, uh, showing our age. <laughs> <laughs> but I think you know the great thing today, and I mean I don't want to hop on you know the the bad old days, but I think the cool thing, the takeaway I see today, and I don't know if you agree, is that the barriers to entry are lower now. So that I like to say, the only thing stopping you is you. So. You know, if you put the work in, it's so much easier today to, to make something of your life. It, it, it's it's a blessing if you really think about it, because yeah. if you think back, and I've heard, I, I've gotten arguments with people, and or people, actually, I don't really, people get in arguments with me, but um, it's one, it's, 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 I wouldn't want to get into an argument with you, Jason, not with your guitar and everything. No, no, but it's one of those things where a lot of people say, well, the CCIE isn't worth it anymore because there's so yeah. many of them, right? Well, if you think back, you know, when, when there was the 500 of them in the world, right? And they were completely sought after. And how the networks from back then changed, you know, a 10 meg, just flipping off of token ring to 10 meg ethernet and yeah. all the stuff that's going on to where we're at today, you know, uh, and all the different tracks, whether it's security or voice or, you know, collaboration or any of these other ones, right? Data center, there's a need for 
each and every one of these, and, and so many more CCIEs than we even currently have today, because think of how many customers there are out there who are running all this stuff who don't have don't have the expertise who really want to learn it. So when people come up to me and say, oh man, what's your number? You're a, oh, you're 60,000 something to, to somebody who just passed it? I'm like, don't, don't down anybody who just achieved their goal because you know whether they, you have a lower number or not or you don't have a number at all, uh, that, that, that's valuable to that person and to who they work for or who they're potentially going to work for. So in my mind, I think the, because the barrier to entry is, is lower, it, I think it's better because if, if you think back, I, me, I mentioned there was one CCNA book. I mean, that was yeah. it. There was one CCNA book. And then Cisco Press started coming out with some more stuff and things like that. And when you started getting into the CCIE, there might have been like, okay, well, here's five books, you know, multicast, you know, the WAN, the WAN book, the LAN book. And that was pretty much it, right? I mean, you didn't have a whole lot to go off of. And you were expected to be an expert at having hands-on experience with all this stuff. And how do you afford it at six thousand dollars for three basic routers, right? It's yeah. it, it's it's insane. And but now, uh, I think it's better. I I enjoy using all all these tools to be able to build up labs and different things like that, just because it's so much easier, right? And it doesn't mean that the certifications are easier. I think the the like you said, the barrier to entry or the methods to practice are more readily available than when we were starting out. Yeah, I mean, I must agree. I mean, the um, I think I think you said it well. You said, and this is my experience as well. You are at your best often when you pass your CCIE, because that's when you've got all that stuff in your head. Because it's been a journey of learning. Um, um, so, like you said about the young guys who've just passed, you can't look down on them because their numbers are higher than say our numbers, because the stuff's fresh. They've learned all the new stuff, and the stuff's fresh. So yeah, congrats to them for passing, you know. So Chuck, when are you getting your CCIE? Are we gonna put pressure on you now? <laughs> you know, you know, I'm gonna ask the uh, the godfather of network programmability. Dude, should, I mean, just knowing the market, and I ask this question, like, I think I've asked every person we've had on this show. Yeah. Should I should I study Python or should I do CCIE? Should I dig into the new stuff uh, or go for the old stuff? I guess that's what you would call it now. My honest opinion, I, I think I said this before to David, was that I would say both. And, yeah. and the reason being is you could go pretty complex into Python and programming. There are programmers that are, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't even consider myself a programmer, right? I do some network engineering scripting with Python. There are programmers who develop things in, in, these, in these languages that are far beyond more skilled than I am. Um, but I think what it is is that it's it's a separate tool that you can put in your tool belt. Really, when you're when you're learning these things, if you're going for your CCIE or, or even NA or NP or any of these, I guess it really applies to all of them. You you have to know the technology and understand what it's going to do before you apply apply any kind of configuration programmatically to it. So, if you think about programmability and things like that to configure networking equipment, it's just a different method of doing something you would do from the command line. Whether you're doing it from the command line, whether you're doing it through the actual GUI on the device, whether you're doing it from a, you know an API call, it's all doing the same things. It's all executing the same commands and it's having a desired outcome on that device. If you execute commands through a programming language and you don't know what they do on the command line, you're you're not really helping anything, right? I mean, it's I think in one line, in one way or another, you would need to know both, and and it's just so you're you're not I want to dissolve the confusion of, of when we talk about programmability that it is you're you're still executing the same outcome on the device but just from a different way. I mean you might say I want to deploy QoS as a transaction you click it you deploy QoS across that device versus going through and saying config T interface you know and all this other good stuff right mm -hmm. um, but if you do it through the through the API and you don't know what it actually does it, 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 from a troubleshooting and support perspective, it makes it kind of hard. Now, there is another school of thought that goes with that, similar to the CCDE, right? Um, in the CCDE, technically, you don't need to know how to configure any of it, right? I mean, in all reality, you're learning about design. You're learning about why a spanning tree is important and why first hop redundancy protocols need to be on this particular switch versus this one. You don't need to know how to go and configure GLBP or something, right? 
it's not part of the exam. That's not what they're testing you on. Interesting. Um, so from a programmability perspective, if there's a tool, say, and I'm just going to pick on DNA Center because it's, it's top I, of I was going to ask this exact question yeah. here in a bit. Like, it's, 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 do you even need it, to know it, programming because yeah. it's abstracted? It's abstracted, DNA right? So the tool yeah. doesn't, if you're using something like DNA Center, it doesn't say, you know, these are, I mean, you can have it tell you the configuration that it's going to dump on the box just like anything else, but you don't need to know the configuration in order to troubleshoot it and or monitor it. So I guess the idea is it really comes down to what role you're wanting to play in the industry and for the company you work for. Because if you come in, there are, there are people who are gonna graduate college and these men and women are gonna come out and know only software defined networking. I mean, it's gonna, it's gonna come down to that point where at some point they're just gonna know software defined networking. Here's the tool they use. This is the outcome I want. I want it to configure QoS so my voice is protected. Click, done. And they may never have to get into layer one, two, and three, right? They may never have that's, to. That's that's scary. To it me. is very like scary. That, and ah. and for the longest time, and I don't know if it's still on there now. There was the OSI model was removed from a lot of the studying, right? And <laughs> it, it's it's <laughs> freaky to think about that because when we were taught, this is what you, where you have to start, right? To to categorize where the issue may be and and how it all works so but nowadays you know there's two schools of thought you know like i said it's you can know it from the command line level and in the, the deep nitty-gritty ones and zeros and understand the programmability piece so you can troubleshoot and be valuable on both aspects of that for your business and then you could just come at it from a programmatic perspective provided you have tools that will do all these different things for you and learning that um but in my mind the only worry i have about that is that Somewhere, somewhere there's going to be some old folks, <laughs> maybe sitting sitting in a room, and they're going to get this knock, and it's going to be a secret knock. It'd be like the SOS knock, and it'll be like, yeah, something isn't working right, and I can't figure it out. And then somebody's going to have to come out and, and, and dig into the into the weeds and break out Wireshark and figure out what's going on. And, and the reason being is that it's always good to understand the fundamentals of what you're working on and if for some reason you don't know the levels that build upon it to get to a DNA center or a software defined controller it's good to look into that because if you find yourself being the only one there which has happened to me uh, and there's no nobody to call when when there's a troubleshooting issue you need to understand both sides of it so I think there's always value in learning it from a tool perspective but there's also value in learning it from a uh, troubleshooting and operations perspective and and with programmability it just makes it that much easier right so you can still learn it from both aspects but in my mind the reason the value programmability has is just to streamline what you're doing right and, and getting value uh, information so I mean you're you're in the sales team at Cisco pretty much so you're you're all about getting the new products out and you you kind of have to have that forward thinking of oh we're going to be putting forward IBN DNA center um, a big part of that's automation machine learning AI um, essentially trying to replace network engineers because that's that's the fatal flaw right now in the networks is people designing things badly so I'm curious I know that's a loaded uh, question, Chuck. Loaded I, well, it's, question. I, I'm not even done yet. So, <laughs> so, so I, I always hear it's good to know the underlying concepts. It's good to know about routing and switching. But at the same time, when you have DNA Center, you're going to have a support contract. You're, gonna, you're just going to call TAC. And also, DNA Center uses the entire TAC database to know how to solve problems. So I'm curious, in what scenario do you actually need to know anything uh, that's with that model? That is a double loaded question. So first off, let me start with the first thing you said, with, which, which was uh, replacing uh, jobs and network engineers. Highly doubt that's going to happen. Um, you know, when, the, when, the, when Skynet happens and the world starts getting run by robots, um, maybe. But, but for now, um, maybe. <laughs> maybe. You always got to have... And, and that didn't turn out well there either, did it? Nothing's impossible, right? No. But... Um, but Really, in reality, you know, you're you're trying to augment, and and like you said, one of the biggest fatal flaws is it's not so much in designing things improperly as much as it is not being able to get to the resolution or the root cause of something in in a quick and efficient way. So when you, mm. when you mentioned DNA Center with Assurance, Assurance is what uses that database and goes through and, and identifies issues and potentially gives you guided remediation on how to fix them, or at some point soon being able to just fix these things automatically for you. 
Now, that would save a lot of time. And I think that's the biggest value of when we talk about these tools, it, it comes down to time because for customers, time is money. And if I, if I have uh, you know, a CCIE on my staff, or even if they're not a CCIE, I have a senior person on staff and she might be sitting there saying, uh, you know, I'm, I'm spending all my time troubleshooting this one particular wireless issue and I can't do any of these other things that I have, all these projects are falling behind, you know, I'm, I'm really getting frustrated. I, I either need more staff to augment that or I need better tools or, you know, I need a vacation. There's something I need to be able to do. And when we start talking about tools like assurance to be able to uh, alleviate some of that and get to the root cause of that, that's where that comes in. Now. I, I do believe, though, the process of how you run your network will definitely change, especially think of a help desk perspective or, or service desk perspective, right? The flow, what is the typical flow? The flow is user calls in, there's a problem, ticket gets generated, tickets get put in the network engineering queue or network operations queue, sits there for about a week. <laughs> Uh, then so, <laughs> somebody opens it, and it was a wireless issue that happened last Tuesday at 3 p.m., right? Which is almost impossible to troubleshoot because it could have been transient, it could have been interference, it could have been a million different things, right? Um, so the process of how you engage with your network is going to definitely change. In my opinion, I think with programmability and integrations, like I, I mentioned ServiceNow, just, just because... We have an integration with ServiceNow. There's a whole bunch of other mm -hmm. help desk uh, ticketing systems that we're, we're gonna integrate with as well using these open APIs and SDKs. But from a ServiceNow perspective, just say you're a ServiceNow customer, the flow could change drastically. So the flow might be an issue happens, nobody has to call it in, it automatically reaches out via APIs to ServiceNow and creates a ticket, uses the information in Assurance, DNA Center with Assurance to say, this is the issue, this is what it's impacting, this is how you fix it, maybe even automatically fix it in the future, and here's, here you go. Now, it, instead of waking up at 2 o'clock in the morning to get on VPN, to get in the command line, to go see what's going on, the issue is either resolved or you at least know what the issue is immediately before you even have to go, you know, try to search for it. So. You just described Skynet. You know that, right? I, I, but, <laughs> but the good news is DNA Center doesn't have glowing red eyes, so, I mean... Not yet. Anymore. Well, that, that's, in, that's in the next update. <laughs> that's the next update. <laughs> One to two to eight. No. Um, but if you think about it, it's just the flow will change, right? And But they'll, they'll still need to have network operations engineers and networking engineers who design the network, who build the network, who still go through and troubleshoot the, the network. I'm, th I'm talking about there's, there's things that right now, if you think about data center and you think about contact center and voice and all the different things that go along with that video, pervasive video, there's so many things that can go go um, awry with configuring these different things. And even though we're working towards the ability to streamline and automate a lot of these different technologies, it, it's gotten to the point where, I, in my opinion, it's it's still, there's still a lot to do for a network engineer, right? And I think when, the reason these tools are coming out is to just make it easier on folks, right? The biggest thing is that you know, if I say I want to configure quality of service, you know, everybody's brain starts going, well, what do I got to do to configure quality of service? And it's a nightmare. And, and evident by all the phones you have sitting behind you, you know what I'm talking <laughs> about, right? You know the process to configure all these things and you know what it takes. And if you miss one thing on any one of the hops throughout end-to-end -end quality of service, you're going to have a problem. You potentially have a problem, right? So I think that's it's it's just trying to make things easier for us, easier to troubleshoot, easier to deploy complex solutions in a transaction form. Meaning, I want voice on my, you know, I want quality of service on my voice network. Click, it's done. Then we can go back and validate it. Um, hopefully that answered that that aspect of it. Uh, I think the the second the second part of the question was was more along the lines of, you know, in this day and age, you know, how do we see how do we see the next the next the next generation of network engineers and, and, and how, how do they interact with the network and what is it going to look like? Right, because like, I mean, you're, you're describing the technology now, as right. I imagine, like phase one. Right. I think phase two is to get even more to where you don't have to worry about anything with the network. It's just, it just works. Yep. And, and that's the thing. And the, 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 I would say the, the good thing and the bad thing about this is that 
as you evolve as as a as an engineer, you have to evolve your skill set. So when you when you asked about Python and CCIE, the reason I said mm -hmm. both is because as we start automating these things and different technologies and tasks, you're going to need to know how to use these tools to automate them. Some of them will be just a click button where I'm just going to click a button and automatically it's going to do something for me. But some of them are going to have to be developed. And you know, with our partner organization, with DevNet, with all these tools that we have out there, all these things are going to have to be built. And I do think that at some point we will be able to automate a lot of the mundane tasks and, and things that are, are keeping us up at night and taking our, our time and uh, making our lives a little bit more hectic. But I do also believe that as we as network engineers evolve, we're still going to be just as, as prudent and important. It's just what we'll be doing on a day-to-day -day basis will definitely change, right? And I think a lot of a lot of this is just, we're just now starting to scratch the surface. We, we joke around about things like the internet of coffee mugs and, and all these other things <laughs> and how everything's connected and, and, you know, but the truth in reality is if you really honestly think about it, there are so many things that I can think of just off the top of my head that aren't connected right now that could potentially be. And everything that we add onto our network just drives more and more complexity. It drives more and more data and it just makes things more and more difficult. Um, you know, even even something as simple as, as doorbells that you can actually see what's going on, right? Now it's getting to the point where, well, it's a latency issue. If If I have a doorbell and somebody's all of a sudden you know, hit a packet of pocket of latency. My package could be riding off on a packet of, a pocket of latency somewhere. You know, just because I don't have <laughs> high speed quality of service going to my doorbell. Like, who thinks about these things, right? You know, my coffee pot. You know, did I leave it on? Did I turn it off? Can I have it make me a mocha frappuccino? I don't know. Let me think. <laughs> you know, it's 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 evolving rapidly, and I, I'm excited to see where it goes. Um, but with my with my children, I think from having a four year old and a ten month old to be able to just imagine what they're going to see. Um, I can't you can't you can't? Like, it just shocks me. It just uh, shocks me. So I, I, a bigger question. So I mean, you're bigger you're than at that the forefront. One? <laughs> I mean, you, <laughs> <laughs> so you're you're really at the forefront of things. You know what's going on with Cisco. You 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 know things you're not even telling us right now. I know you do. Um, <laughs> uh, what should a person learn right now? Like what should they focus on coming fresh into CCNA or Cisco? Uh, I mean, I know everyone's going to say, well, get your CCNA, get the base routing and switching stuff, uh, learn Python, but really, really what should they dig into? And is even routing and switching even viable anymore? Should they go to a, a collaboration track or data center or service provider? So, and that's a great question. Uh, I wouldn't say, I wouldn't say that one is more important than the other. But it all does definitely depend on what you're looking to do uh, with your career. So if, you're, if your focus is on, you know, I just want to do collaboration, you know, it'd be good to understand how switching works and quality of service and, and trunking and how that stuff flows across it. But you don't necessarily need to know how to go and configure, you know, BGP, for, for example. You, you might not ever touch it. And, and it's right. very similar and analogous to the CCDE, the mindset situation. You hear a lot of stuff about the CCDE mindset where, there's the CCDE comes in, they design everything, and then they say, here you go, Mr. CCIE, Mr. CCIE, you are now the implementation arm of that. So now that I've designed it, I don't have to think about how you implement it, I don't have to think about any of those other things, the amount of RAM in a, in a router or how to configure some of these things, I just design it and I hand it over to you. So mm -hmm. depending on your role, you may be somebody, and this, I don't want this to sound negative in any way, shape, or form. You know, Earlier I mentioned that you might be graduating from college and using a tool like DNA Center, and that might be the only tool you use, or you, you might be using online, you know, just GUIs for, for everything, right? That might be the new way of managing and administering your network. So if you're sitting in there and you're, you're in UCCE or CUCM or any of these, these other tools, you may never need to know how to configure something on a command line in... You know what I mean? It, it might be not the world that you're living in. Um, from a, Does that make you sad? In a way, but in a way, it, par partially. And it's only because I really love people knowing about things. So I, I want them to yeah. learn these things and these technologies. Um, but outside of that, in a way, it's like, well, if we don't have to, then why should we, right? I mean, why don't we make it easier for everybody? Um, 
And then there will be a balance of that, I'm sure, coming out, you know, with, with these new tools and, and temp-based networking and software-defined this and software-defined that, um, software-defined metal dev ops. You will, you will, you will, you will, you will have, uh, you will have that balance where some folks may never ever touch the command line ever again. Some may, folks may only do programmability and, and APIs and Python and SDK. Some folks will be just command line. So it really, I think there's going to be a mix and getting them all work together, uh, or working together to drive towards something. I think is, that's the, that's the value of doing all these different things. It's just trying to make the world a better place in my opinion. Uh, so hopefully that roundaboutly sort of possibly answered the question that you might have asked. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you got me somewhere, but yeah, I, yeah I'll just say yes, it did. Um, but it, it's hard because a lot of guys coming into the industry, they're, especially when I first came into it, I was you know very forward looking. I'm like, I want to pick the technology that I know is going to be on fire for me. I want to make the most money. I want to accelerate as fast as I can. I want to pick the right thing. And right now, there's so many options and there's so much doubt in kind of gray area. Uh, you see things like VMware's NSX where it's almost an afterthought with the networking. It's being absorbed by the, the system engineers. And then you got the cloud and, and, and Cisco's embracing all of that and they're kind of removing part of the stuff that we already do. So it's just, it's a confusing landscape. Yeah, it, re it really is. I mean, and especially with all the different types of technology that are out and available. And that's one of the things that, you know, Cisco, I would say, has going for it, but is also a little bit of a detriment is the fact that Cisco has, uh, you, you know, they have to apply and appeal to the broadest audience possible. And I mean, the reason I say this is because we have the widest net of, of customers. So we have to have the options that go across all the different types of customers who want to do something with our equipment or our technology in their environment. So there are so many different things that, that have to be consumed, you know, whether it's I'm, I want to run this in this particular design or I want to use it for service provider or I want to only run voice on it or whatever it may be. Or maybe I want to just use the GUI that's on every single device to manage my network. You know, a lot of SMBs run, run that way as well. So <clears throat> it's, it's, it's kind of one of those things where you have to, you, you really have to feel out where everything is going and kind of, figure out where your passion is. And, and, and that's, that's, that's one of the most complicated things to ask somebody nowadays. And I think a lot of it, it comes down to if, if you're really passionate about technology and you're really passionate about you know, configuring stuff on the command line, I would say continue to go down that path because you will still be valuable for a very, very, very long time in a lot of different places, right? A lot of different customers, a lot of different vendors, a lot of different areas in the world always and still will need that, that value. Um, but if you're passionate about doing things differently and, and things are being taught very differently nowadays, uh, men and women are coming out of school and they're, they're seeing things in a completely different light than, than we've ever seen uh, in the past. And everybody's used to a device like this where it, it just needs to be simple, instant, on, always. And mm -hmm. if you think about that, the network is following suit. It really is. I mean, it's the network has to be on, simple, available, always no matter what, because everything else runs on the top of it. So no matter what aspect of technology you're getting into, whether it's a piece or component that sits on top, like collaboration, video, voice, or it's a core fundamental like routing, service provider, you know, WAN, whatever it may be, I think everybody will have their own niche and area of place to focus on. But I think the bigger thing and change that is coming is that it's all going to be finally working together in concert which in the likes of we've never seen before. So hopefully that makes sense. It does. It does. And I, th I think um, people can take that one of two ways. They can take it as, oh, my job's finally going to actually get done or be easier. Or they might take it as, I'm not going to have a job anymore. So I think it's, it's interesting. But I, I'm going to be optimistic. I'm going to say that it's going to make our jobs easier. We're going to be able to learn more cool, better things. And that's that's the outlook right now. That's, that's what I'm going to spin that as. <laughs> you have to. You're selling it. I, I don't have the beard to fall back on, though. So. <laughs> I think it's also important to remember, like you said, there's such a breadth of customers that um, just have a reality check is that we talk about all these cool technologies and wonderful things, but to reach certain customers, it's going to take a really, really long time. I mean people still use Windows XP or old versions of stuff that we, 
you know, when we talk about the new stuff, we wouldn't even consider. But it takes time for all customers to reach sort of what we're talking about at the moment. Yeah, yeah, I mean, and that's the thing is, I don't think it's ever going to be an overnight flip where no. tomorrow Skynet's running the world, right? It's going to be one of those things where. <laughs> Isn't that how it happened? Yeah, well, I, I don't know. <laughs> I, I said, I'll be back. And then next thing you know, uh, you know, <laughs> he just kept coming back. So I guess that's a good thing. But you know, see, there you go. The case, case in point, he was still useful. He just kept coming back, see? You know? But um, I, I do think that eventually it'll it'll kind of grow into one of these things that uh, it's almost like a choose-your-own-adventure type thing at this point in, in, in the industry, right? Now, where you can kind of really pick whatever it is that you want to do from a technology perspective and find a way to really advance and make a, make a business out of it. And people are doing that all the time, especially with some of these new innovations and things like that that are coming out. They're, they're pretty fascinating. With your breadth of knowledge, would you, um, have rather, would you rather have started your career now, fresh, or would you have preferred to start when you did back then? I'm, I'm, I'm one of those uh, sentimental, sentimental types, uh, you know, <laughs> Uh, I, I, I still have some of the old pieces and components from my very first computer, and, and maybe I'm a hoarder. I don't know, but uh, so, so <laughs> some, some of these things, some of these things that, you know, they mean a lot to me. And when you're sitting there thinking back of how everything started and first using a 300 baud modem and, and, and dialing in the AOL and the beginning of the Internet and all these other things and beginning of cell phones and the beginning of, of wireless and it's like it's fascinating to see how it is. So now I know how my how my dad and mom felt. We're like, yeah, well, your great grandpa, you know, was one of the one of the folks who invented the color TV. And I'm like, that's fantastic, you know, that's awesome. But uh, I couldn't imagine, you know, a black and white TV, you know, from you know, it's like uh, back in my day we had to configure routers and switches. Yeah, back in my day, I had to use punch cards. I'm like, yeah, what did you do with them? You know, like oh, I I just fold them up and it put them underneath the leg of the table so they it stays balanced. Uh, but um, no, I don't know. It's 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 pretty fascinating to see. So I I would say I would have in my time. I, I say because I'm sentimental. I would have liked to start when I did. Um, but then for all the folks that I I, I, I do mentoring with and, and everybody I talk to, I encourage everybody to start now. And the reason being is that because of the stuff we talked about at the beginning of the call, it was never like this. We have so many different ways to get started now. And you can go from like, I could literally go from one website and start from an, a novice to an expert, right? And learn all these different things, right? Mm -hmm. Learning at Cisco.com has a tremendous amount of information on it too that's completely and utterly free. So there's so much stuff out there that you can learn from uh, to just get going and start. So the biggest thing to do is to take the first step. And I think that it's, it's frightening for a lot of folks. I mean, I'm... I'm kidding you not if I tell you that I was in Barcelona, Spain last year for Cisco Live riding in a taxi and the person wanted to get into technology instead of one day that they were studying for their CCNA like eight years ago, nine years ago, and they stopped and they started riding, they started driving taxi. And do you think it's too late for me to get back into it? And I, I, just, I looked at the person, I said, no. Like this is, the fact that you're still thinking about it means that you should go for it. You should literally go for it. I mean, you can literally go to Cisco.com and start reading. I mean, there's so many things out there right now that wasn't there before. You could literally change your life at, in a matter of, 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 you know, weeks, months, and years, depending on if you're... <laughs> well, I think you're exactly right. I think the problem with nowadays is that Training and information has never been more readily available and never been more accessible, but that also means that entertainment and distractions have also never been more readily available. So it's a battle. It's a battle. We have such short attention spans, especially, you know, the younger generation. We can never focus on one thing at a time. Uh, it's hard. I, I mean, video games are so amazing now. You got VR. You can pretty much just leave your, your world and go to somewhere else. It's, I mean, I'll be, I'll be honest. I'm tempted with that. So that, that's the big battle now is discipline. Yeah, well, you know, and the funny thing is, if you've seen, if you've been any of the Cisco Lives lately and, and gone by the Learning at Cisco booth, they have a VR, or an, I'm sorry, an AR CCIE kind of uh, lab where you can you put on, oh, the, yeah, you put on the headset that. and you can move and plug that. stuff in and you can type in commands and you can move, move devices and, and look at show commands by going like this. That I could see being the next generation of testing. In addition to wow, why yeah. not make interactive training that way, 
right? So the folks who do want to sit there and play video games can play video games, <laughs> but the video game is is like okay, so I'm gonna th you know throw this packet over here and oh it bounced off of this wall because there's an access list or whatever it may be, right? <laughs> um, it, it's just fascinating how the different modalities that we have to get access to all this. I think this you just content. gave David an idea. David's over there <laughs> thinking about. <it. laughs> how do we do this? You know? Correct. <laughs> So I don't know. I could see that. I could see that coming out and being learning video games. If it, if they have it for my children, why not have it for us? I think I think you hit it on the head there when you said that there's just different options for different people. People who are gamers may prefer learning that way. Some people may prefer a traditional book. But there's so many options now. It's I think Chuck, you've also said something really important. It's you've got to be disciplined to do it and i think it comes back to how badly do you want it yeah yeah there have That's been times it. that i remember and and everybody out there who watches this is going to laugh at me but i remember you know there was there was a, a, a motivational speaker that said if you want it you have to envision it in your head put a little sticky or something on your mirror every morning and you look at that as your goal and you keep saying it over and over and over and over in your head and you essentially to the point you believe it and I can remember literally running on the treadmill at home saying, I will be a CCIE. I will be a CCIE. I will be and a CCIE. And your ponytail's in the wind. Yeah. <laughs> nah, yeah. Um, I will be a CCIE. And, you know, I'm sitting there thinking, and I think back to that, and I'm like, I wanted that so bad. I mean, there was, there was yeah. nothing more I wanted in life than to get that and then to come work at Cisco. And... To not get it the few times was was debilitating, right? I mean, when you when you don't yeah. pass, it, it it's it really takes a toll, Chuck. You know, I mean, I know you were taking some exams recently, and I was commenting back and forth with you on it. And the biggest the biggest advice that I could give is 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 get up every single time you fall. I mean, yeah. and and play the Rocky soundtrack over and over and over again. I do I do it all, you know <laughs> I do it all the time when I when I'm gearing up for something. I listen to the the Rocky soundtrack, and uh, it gives me energy. But it, it, it's just the biggest thing is, you know, when I said it, I, I failed a couple times before and I didn't change anything between the time I failed and, and the time I took it for the last time before it switched on me, that was my fault, right? Every, every single time you do something, it's a learning opportunity, whether you succeed in it or not. Uh, it's, it's a different way of going about something and you learn something from every experience. And for me, I, I had blinders on, you know, I was in this... I'm just, I was so focused. I got to do these labs. I'm gonna, I'm gonna get my CCIE. I'm gonna get my CCIE. That I didn't take a step back to look at what I was doing. Um, you know, going through things too fast, not concentrating, getting stuck in lab mode, not paying attention to friends and family, and and having that balance. That was huge. Um, so I think that uh, I think there's something out there for everybody. But I think is the biggest advice that I have is for folks going and getting into this is to just. just Dust yourself off, get up, and go again. Because guess what? You're not alone. Everybody you see and look up to who has a CCIE or, or all eight CCIEs and a CCDE or whatever, uh, they've all failed. They've all failed. Everybody's failed, and they've had to get up and and go for it. And, and one of the biggest sayings that I, I love is somebody said this. They said, what do you call a doctor who passed with the lowest score in, yeah. in med school? And it's doctor, right? <laughs> no, nobody's going to be like, hey, what did you score on it? Who cares? Because I'm a doctor, right? <laughs> I'm a CCIE. You're a CCIE. It, it doesn't matter. And, and the folks always come up and go, oh, well, what's your number? Because my number is, you know, 7,000 something or whatever. They're, they're in it for the wrong reason. You know what yeah. I mean? And um, the, the honest to God's truth is that you've succeeded in something that you've set your mind to. And and achieve that goal. And now the best thing to do is continue on and have another goal so you, you don't get lazy. And don't, don't, don't rest on your laurels too much and sit around and expect everything to be handed to you because you've achieved a goal. Other people who are achieving a lot more um, and have been in a lot worse situations than we're in, um, they don't give up. And that's the common, the common theme to all these folks. So. Yeah. That's good. That's a good, good advice. That's great advice because, like, yeah, I guess a lot of people see the CCIE as their end game, but they don't realize that technology is moving so fast, you're never going to stop. You're, I mean, you're, it literally is a treadmill. 
you kind of said that earlier. If you stop moving, you get taken off the ride. <laughs> and, and it hurts. And, and, uh, if you don't like that, it'll get, get into the industry. Right. Yeah. And that's the thing. It's like for me, it, the CCIE was the legitimate beginning of my career. And it's crazy because I, I had had 10, 15 years of experience prior to that. And I did all these things. But what you've learned and gather and all the doors it's opened. And I mean, I'm sitting here with you two. We're, we're doing an interview right now, right? Like I'm important <laughs> or something. It, it, you know, it, it's crazy. Well, you are. You know, it, it's one of well, those first things. First five guys canceled, but yeah. Yeah, yeah you know, and, uh, and I pushed it off a couple times, you know, but, but, um, but it, it's just one of those things that um, it really does change your life. And, but the other thing I want to make sure that everybody's clear on is that it doesn't have to be CCIE, right? That changes your life. It could be NA, it could be NP, it could be Python, it could be aerobics class, it could be yoga, it could be whatever you want that you set a goal towards, that you want to work towards, that can change your life for the better. And it might be, one of the goals for me might be putting a pin in the CCDE and spending more time with my family, right? If that's what rejuvenates you and that's what makes you better and, and helps you continue on and, and, and work towards your goals, then so be it. I wanted to just say something that I think you you kind of alluded to when you're talking about CCIE. I think the great thing about CCIE is you don't know what you don't know. And I think that process of going through CCIE shows you all the gaps in your knowledge. And I think that's kind of what you said. I don't know if you agree with that, Jason. 100%, you know, uh, so the, there's there's definitely a gap. There, and there was a huge gap between NP and IE for the longest time. And going through the actual process of doing the lab exam and getting rejected and going back and figuring out your, your weak spots and focusing on them and then basically yeah, shining yeah. a spotlight right on them and drilling them down. Yeah, yeah. I, I mentioned earlier that MPLS was, I, I was afraid of it. I, I hated it. It was new and I didn't understand it and there was not a lot of technology books on it. I presented Cisco Live on MPLS all the time now, right? I, 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 I you know, I'm sitting here thinking, how, how can I make a slide that would really capture and captivate everybody in the audience about MPLS? So I, I built a slide and you can, you can download it on CiscoLive.com and watch the presentation, but it comes up and it says MPLS, most painful to learn and study. <laughs> <laughs> You know, um, and it was for the longest time. I was I was petrified of MPLS and quality of service and multicast and IP services and all these things that are outside of the core, if you will, that there wasn't a whole lot of, of uh, material on. And then I got to the point where I'm like, okay, well, I've got to learn this regardless because I'm getting my CCIE. Uh, so I just, I kept flashing the flashlight in a dark space called MPLS and I kept playing with it and I kept working with it kept doing labs on it to the point where it's like there was nothing at the time that MPLS could do to me that I didn't know how to fix or how to troubleshoot or how to configure. And that opened up a lot of different doors for me. Just that, I mean, that alone, I'm it, the fact that I'm speaking on that at Cisco Live and that was one of my most scary topics to, to learn really does show you that as long as you focus on something that you, you want to achieve, it can change your life in ways you've never even thought possible. Um, now, do you love you, MPLS now? Is I do. Your favorite? I do love it. I do love it. Now, everybody says, well, SD-WAN means uh, there's going to be no more MPLS, so that there's always this philo philosophical... That was my next question. How can you, a good conscience, sir, teach on MPLS, then sell SD-WAN on the side? <laughs> so it's, it's, it's awesome because what I do is then I go say, well, and if you, if you want to make your life easier with all this, you just automate it with this book. And... Uh, <laughs> uh, Oh, man. It's so funny. I think, I think another lesson there, Jason, sorry to interrupt, is that you turned a weakness into a strength. So the thing that you were scared of became something that's a strength now. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it was it was odd because, you know, I, I have I have customers and, and, and even non-customers, people who, who attend the uh, sessions reaching out to me and asking me questions on, on LinkedIn and stuff about how they should possibly configure something or or you know how this might work in this particular environment, and I just sat, I, I sat back and I I actually got a message yesterday um, about um, BFD on G, GRE tunnels, and I sat back in my chair and I'm like, it's so interesting that you know in the past when I was learning this I wouldn't have come up and asked me, 
<laughs> I'm a big deal. <laughs> I'm like, I'm like, no, like, no, no, like, I, I, I didn't know it well at the time. Like, it, 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 back then, I would have been like, I wouldn't have listened to me for nothing. And then I'm sitting there thinking, like, I can't believe people are actually asking me these things. And and it's it, I, I can actually provide value and, and impact to them, which is which is tremendous, you know. And and again, like you said, change, you know, changing something from a a, a weakness into a strength is it's the that's how a lot of people get over their fears and get over uh, some of the things that, that kind of hold them back in life in, in many yeah. different things outside of technology. Yeah. I like what Jeremy Chara says. He says, you love what you know. So a lot of times everything like from CCNA to CCP to CCIE, there's so many things that you just don't know yet. And it's kind of scary, daunting. You might even start to hate it because you don't know it. But once you know it, I mean, you, you fall in love with it. It's just getting over that hurdle. Yeah. It's getting over the hurdle. And, and, the hardest thing to, to kind of go off of Jeremy's quote there is if you can find a way to love what you don't know, that is the mm-hmm. hardest thing, right? I mean, that's some deep stuff right it's, there. It's, it's, <laughs> no, it, it's, it's just one of those, it, it's just one of those things that like it, it take, if you can somehow find a way to take the fear out of your, your way, like out of your process of whatever it is you're doing, and really truly get excited about learning new things, then it can change your life. It really can. And I was, I was, I was fortunate that that kind of happened for me along the way that when I hear about something new that comes out, you know, I, I don't think of it from the, the negatives of, uh, you know, once we automate everything, you know, people are going to be looking at us through our thermostats and stuff. It, I look at it more. So wouldn't it be really cool if for some reason, you know, a data center might be overheating and it can automatically detect that and change the hot and cold, hot and cold flow of the air from the crack units automatically and adjust all these different things using automation. And if you think about that, it's like, wow, that's fascinating. And you, you, so I just, just applying technology to different ways of, uh, of, of achieving things I think is fascinating. And then even one step further than that would be, I would say the only thing that is limiting us to our futures, especially you know, when you're thinking of IOT and connections and networking is our imagination. Because if somebody can figure out a way to make a checkbook that you can write on and it automatically sends all this stuff, it, you know, a digital checkbook that's wireless and sends all this information, you don't even actually have to print out or rip off a check anymore. I mean, we're living in a pretty cool time right now. Hey, well, real quick, I'm going to, if it's okay with you, David, I want to give uh, Jason a speed round real quick. Yeah, it's about time for that. All right. So I'm going to ask you some quick questions. Try to keep your answer as succinct as you can. Um, anyway, here we go. Your favorite routing protocol? BGP. Favorite area of the Cisco tracks? Uh, route switch. Favorite flavor of ice cream? Chocolate. So that's that's the one you were downing when you were uh, jumping on the bed? <laughs> coffee, coffee or tea? Decaf coffee and tea. Oh, okay. Favorite router of all time? The ASR 9000. <laughs> of course. <laughs> I have a thing that says the Awesome Super Router 9000. It's a big, <laughs> a big awesome sign. It's pretty cool. Yeah, the ASR. Come on, the 2500. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> 2501 got me there, that's for sure. Uh, 2501, come on. Yeah, yeah that's your sentimental. Come on. All right, um, routing or switching? <sighs> switching. Um, this is a hard one. It might take more than uh, just one answer. College or certifications or both? Yes. Best case scenario. Best case Least scenario. amount of money. Um, so I didn't go to college, which is going to be news for a lot of people out there. Um, you know, I got my good diploma. And a lot of people ask me about college because it's such a big topic. Um, and I, hopefully I didn't uh, just you know cut myself out of any type of vice president promotions or anything like that. But... Uh, <laughs> um, you know, I didn't go to college, and it, it, I ended up focusing on, sec- on the certifications and learning stuff that I found useful and applying it. So you can definitely make it without college. Um, am I telling my kids, do I want them to go to college? Yes. And there are, there are times that you might find yourself in a situation that, you know, maybe a, a little bit more of, uh, you know, this type of, of learning might, might help me in some situation, you know, uh, and I think learning as much as you can can never hurt so i would say college yes if you can um but also don't be afraid that if you don't want to or you want to put it on hold 
to go down the other route of certifications and things as well because you may decide that you you don't necessarily need to go to college. So hopefully cool. that helps somebody out there. I think it will. That's a great answer. All right, now next question. If you could be one character from Harry Potter, which one would you be? Definitely not the guy who keeps throwing up slugs. Um, <laughs> you, everybody, on, everybody on here is going to laugh at me, and especially I know Sylvia is out there. She's going to she's going to be upset with me as well. Um, I have never seen any of the Harry Potter movies, um, and and the funny thing is, uh, every time I turn on the TV and they're on, it's always that one kid throwing up slugs, and I have no idea why. I don't know the context of it. I don't know the background of it. Um, I just don't want to be that kid. So uh, maybe Harry Potter because he seems to be the, the hero in all these things. Uh, yeah. He's got a lot going for him. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I know I got some catching up to do. A shame on you. Um, I expect you to read all the books before we uh, meet at Cisco Live. Okay. Um, iPhone or Android? iPhone. Okay. Mac or PC? Mac. All right. And then when is the CCNA going to be renewed? When is the CCNA? Well, that's an honesty question. <laughs> <laughs> well, my CCNA was renewed when I recertified a couple months ago for using continuing education. So I, I'm good oh, for another, I'm no, good for another four like years like that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't necessarily have the answer to that particular question, unfortunately. Great, oh, great answer. Okay, Mr. PR. <laughs> oh, and favorite band? Metallica. Metallica. All right. Yep. Hands down. Um, all right. Well, that's all I had. But I would have to say a close second would be Megadeth because I love those guys too. Really enjoyed that. Thanks so much for sharing. No, no problem. Thanks so much for having me again. I greatly appreciate it. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm looking forward to uh, seeing how uh, the industry takes what I just said. <laughs> uh, that was great. And then we'll work out on uh, some of those SD-WAN videos and things we were talking about as well. So That'd be good. And um, we'll see you at Cisco Live, I'm sure. I hope oh, yeah. so. Yes, both of you will be in U.S., right? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. oh so good. I'm so excited. Um, for the, So about that, um, I always go on, these, about trip, that, yes, I always go on <laughs> these trips, and I have to leave my, my wife at home. And this trip for Cisco Live U.S. is the first time uh, my wife is a preschool teacher, and it's the first time that she will have the time off. And the last day of Cisco Live is our 10-year wedding anniversary. So I am bringing okay. her with to the appreciation event and and half of Cisco Live and then we're going to take some time out in San Diego and just kind of see the sights and it'll be Excellent. interesting to 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 see how that uh, well basically how she reacts to all this stuff um, <laughs> and uh, it'll, it'll be quite interesting to, to uh, see how uh, folks interact with her so yeah because you're pretty much famous now so I mean it's it's gonna it's gonna be cool for her to see your husband all famous she's like what do you do in the basement all the time? All I hear is like wailing guitar riffs and then nothing for a long time. And then another wailing guitar riff and then nothing for a long time. I'm like, oh, I'm on a video, you know, podcast or interview or, you know, working on something. She's like, well, how come it gets so quiet? I'm like, well, I, I, I can't record. I can't play the guitar while I'm talking. So I have to put it down for a while. But she's, she's, like, she's like, you don't even work, do you? And I'm like, no. And the reason no. is because I love my job, right? Truth is, if you love what you do, you never work a day in your life. So um, keep that philosophy, and I think that uh, we'll all be we'll all be old and gray, and, and still loving what we're doing. Like David. Thank you, Chuck. <laughs> I'd anyway, say I, I might. What, I might. What, what are you saying, America? These young whippersnappers. The whippersnappers. <laughs> all right. I, I might be gray, but I don't have any hair to show. So, yeah. Chuck, don't worry. One day your beard will be gray. But it will still be yeah, an yeah. epic beard. <laughs> yeah, I'll be like Gandalf. It'll be amazing. I'm actually looking forward to it. Oh, that'll be great. And hopefully, you shall pass. <laughs> oh, that is. I might. I might have to just. If I do take my CCIE, I'm making a promise. I'm going to come there dressed as Gandalf. You have to. You have to. <laughs> yeah, I have to now. I'm, I'm, let's, let's put that in the books. <laughs> <laughs> I shall pass. <laughs> Thank you all again. All right, Jason. Yeah, this is amazing, dude. Thank you so much for taking the time. I know your time is valuable, so this is going to be killer for so many people. I mean, you, your thing is changing people's lives, and that's our that's our gambit too. So, it's going to be awesome. Well, I do people are really going to benefit from your your story and, and all the things you've done. Thank you, thank you very much. And again, I look forward to doing more with you guys. Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah, definitely. Cheers, Cheers Jason. Jason. Thanks, Thanks so much. much. Take care, everyone. Thanks. Cheers. Bye. Bye.